I'm Victor Margiotta, and this is The Community Show. I'm truly blessed to have Father Vincent from the Assumption Church in Peekskill. And uh, he's here to talk about a little about himself, but he's going to talk about his uh, mission and uh, what he's doing in the community sh and uh, how he's uh, working hard to bring people back to God. So thank you so much, Father Vincent, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Victor. And uh, just to get a little taste of uh, where you're from and where you grew up, I'm going to ask you where you're from, where you grew up. Sure. Yeah, I was born in Onken Heights, Illinois, which is outside of Chicago. But I'm the youngest of six, and when I was a baby, we moved to Carmel, Indiana. So I grew up in, in Carmel, Indiana, went to Our Lady of Mount Carmel grade school, went to Cathedral High School in Indianapolis, went to Wabash College in Crawfordsville, Indiana, uh -huh. and then worked for a year in Indy uh, after college, and then went to graduate school at the University of Chicago before coming out to New York, uh, right before 9-11, actually. Okay. And, uh, but uh, I grew up, had a, just such a blessed experience as a kid. Uh, good Catholic family, um, played sports, ran around the neighborhood, had friends with tons of brothers and sisters. So it was kind of an idyllic childhood, yeah. I have to say. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so blessed. And, uh, and that's where kind of my faith was inculcated there by my parents and by uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church back in Carmel, Indiana. So what made you decide to become a priest? A lot of factors. Okay. Um, when I was a kid, we had great priests at yeah. my parish, wow. and I was a server. And from the very beginning, when we made our first communion, I really believed that Jesus is present in the Holy Eucharist. And I've never tired of that mystery, and I've always been captivated by that. And it caught me when I was young, and it still does captivates me, that in the hands of the priest is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And I remember thinking as a kid, if that, you know, if that's true, that's the greatest miracle that happens on any given day. I want to be close to that. And so there was a foundation there. Um, I happened to have, you know, just a blessing of a fantastic grade school. Um, and it was just, it was just part of our family life. I mean, for us, absolutely, we went to Mass every single day at grade wow. school, Monday through Friday, and then as a family on Sundays for eight years. So the faith was pretty uh, firm and, and planted in my family. Mm -hmm. um, and since I did enjoy serving and you know, uh, when I was younger, some of the times the, the kids would say, hey, are you going to be a priest? I'm like, oh, come on, lay off, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but when I was uh, 13, I went out and did a retreat um, with a group that uh, you can go and do like boarding school. And they ask you at the end of that, you know, do you think Christ is calling you to be a priest? And I remember wow. coming home and telling my parents, you know, I think, I think God has called me. Wow. And they said, you know, it's a little far from home. It was in Connecticut and I was in mm -hmm. Indiana. And uh, they said, why don't you, you know, stay home, stay around yeah, here. We'll yeah. see what happens. So I went to high school. And, uh, you know, I fell in love, and I had my eyes set on someone. I thought, you know what, I think I'm going to marry that girl. Yeah. And so I got involved in sports, played baseball, played a little ball in college, played some rugby. And, uh, you know, I would say in college, kind of lost my way. You know, lived in a fraternity and a lot of parties. And sure. Intellectually, I also kind of lost my foundation, and I was flirting with, you know, pluralism and the idea that, you know, maybe all the religions are true. And... Um, and what kind of woke me up, I had probably three powerful experiences where God just spoke directly to my soul. Once was uh, on a train. I was traveling from Chicago out to uh, Colorado to mm -hmm. visit a friend in, in Wyoming who uh, takes people out into nature going hiking and reads the Bible and, and tries to help people discover God again in the beauty of nature in the mountains. Oh, man. And I knew I was going to see him, and I knew we'd probably be talking about God. And I, you know, I kind of lost my way. And I remember I was going through uh, Nebraska, and there's just cornfields forever in Nebraska. And I remember I sat down at the window seat, and there's a seat next to me, and there was no one there. And there was nothing there when I sat down. And I was just daydreaming, looking out the window. And I remember saying, I was like, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? What are you calling me to do, you mm -hmm. know? And I was thinking and, and just kind of daydreaming. And as I came out of that, I looked to my left, and I literally winced because on the chair next to me was... Life magazine with Pope John Paul II on the cover. Wow. And, and it scared me. Like, I don't know how it got there. I didn't hear anybody put it there. I didn't hear him fall. I was scared. And I, and I knew immediately it was a response from my question to God, you know, because when I was younger, it was there. Yeah. But I kind of tried to avoid that question. So I read about his life, and I was totally inspired. And, uh, but I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for the commitment. But I, I kept that, and it stood out with me. And I had another experience when uh, I was in Italy on spring break. And, uh, and I, I studied in, in Austria in my junior year in college in the sem uh, spring semester. So I had a chance to go down to Italy and see the country 
for spring break, and it was beautiful. Yeah. And I was traveling, and I said, you know, I want to go to Sicily, see where the Godfather is all made, and, you know, yeah. see what it's all about down in Sicily, you know, famous reputation. So I got down there, and, you know, I was kind of, uh, you know, free-spirited back in those days. I had a guitar with me, and I went to this beach in Palermo called Mondello Beach. And I was playing music, and, and I didn't speak any Italian, you know, and uh, these kids didn't speak much English, but they were playing guitar, so they, they asked me to come over. So we started yeah. playing, and they sang all these Beatles songs. And they, didn't, they didn't know what they were saying, but they knew the words. Yeah. And we were having a blast. They said, why don't you come to our village tomorrow? I said, okay. So I met them at the, the opera house, you know, and you hop on a bus, and I thought we were going around the corner. It was like an hour and a half up the mountains wow. in Sicily, and we got out at a little village called Alto Fanto, High Fountain. And it was an old-fashioned village with the goats hanging from the butcher shops yeah. and gelati everywhere. And there, everybody's kissing you on the cheeks and <laughs> escorting you around the village, you know, with the army. They took you right in. And uh, it was amazing. And, yeah. you know, we had a meal. And then we went up on top of the mountain to play music and, and uh, you know, have a party. I had lost my way so much, I didn't realize what time of the year it was. I was just kind of, oh, it's spring. I'm having fun. Well, at night, the lights go down, you know, the sun sets. And you can look down and see the village, and out of the church come torchlight procession. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, a, a statue of, the, of Jesus, but, but deceased, the dead body of Jesus. Okay. And they have the Madonna dressed in black, Our Lady, and it's a, it's a procession. It was Good Friday. Wow. <clears throat> and this moment pierced my heart because I grew up, you know, Always so going well to in the faith. You right. know, I, I had such a fine example of my parents and my school. And I lost my way so much, I didn't even realize it was Good Friday. I couldn't believe it. And I was partying with some kids. And I was so struck at that moment, I started to cry. Hmm. And I said, take me to the train station right now. Like, what? what are you talking about? Yeah, you know, right. No, no, take me down right now to the train station. I, I have to go right now. And so they did. And I, I wanted to get onto a train to get to Rome for Easter. So I got up to yeah, right. And they did. And, and on, the, on the train, I had a lot of time to reflect. I was like, Lord, I'm so sorry. Like, I can't believe I've fallen so far from you. And I got out my first time in Rome, and it was about late on the Easter Vigil. And I just uh, slinked into the back of a church, and I fell asleep. <laughs> I was exhausted. And the Easter Vigil Mass ended, and the, and the usher came and said, get out, get out. So I got out, and I was on the street, and I had, I don't, at that time it was lira. And I only had enough money to, uh, to just go into a restaurant and buy a cup of tea and some crackers. And I was planning I was just going to stay up all night, pull an all-nighter, and see Sunday Mass with Pope John Paul II in, in St. Peter's Square. So then the guy comes over, the bartender, and he says, what time, where are you staying? I'm like, yeah. I have no place to stay. He says, we're closing. I was like, okay, I guess I'll just go into the street. He says, nah, you stay at our place. So he and his wife put me up in their place, you know, the hosp Italian hospitality. Of course. You know? and, but it, it, mean, it meant a lot to me because, uh, you know, I, I, it was like God was taking care of me even though I didn't deserve it. And I woke up the next morning, they had a breakfast prepared. They had left. They trusted me. I couldn't believe it. I had a little, Here's you know, the house. Yeah. Make sure um, you lock up. Anyway. Unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. I, mean, I remember it. And I, so I went down to St. Peter's Square, and I had my backpack and the guitar. And some lady I met there from Pennsylvania, she had a ticket to sit because they had about oh, 500,000 people at the wow. Mass and only 5,000 seats. So the rest have to stand in the back. And she said, here, take one. And I ended up third row with, like, all the nuns and, you know, all the Italians and the old ladies and stuff. Here I was, you know, just totally undeserving of this, you know, oh, lost, yeah. like the prodigal son. And the Lord took me right back. And I, I was able to be at Easter Sunday Mass with Pope John Paul. And I'll never forget that experience. It, it so touched me. And, and when I finally kind of woke up from my, my slumber, mm -hmm. I realized that was the Lord trying to call me back. And then the thing that I, I would say definitively woke me up and changed my life was um, the day 9-11. I arrived in New York from Chicago September 4th. And we had an orientation week. And then we had a, a first assignment where I was, I was doing a fellowship in public affairs with the Coro Foundation. And my assignment was down on Worth Street, the Department of Employment. And we had a half day on the 10th. My first full day of work was supposed to be 9-11. I came out of the subway at the City Hall Municipal Building, and I looked up literally and watched the second tower explode oh over our heads. God. Heard it as if a bomb went off in this room. Oh Loudest thing I ever heard, and I, I ran across the street and just watched the horror of the fire, people jumping, horrible. And it, it was like a nightmare, it was surreal and as if World War III just erupted. And I remember um, the cops came and evacuated where we were, and we started to walk, but the building started to come down at that time. And we didn't know if it was going to fall on top of us, but it went flat, and the fumes chased us out. And I outran the fumes, and I got to Chinatown, and I turned around, and I watched the second tower fall. And I'll never forget it. And I ended up walking home to where I was living, and I called my mom, and my sisters were together all crying. And I went back down to Ground Zero to 
do something. And I was a civilian volunteer for about five days, and it changed my life. I had two powerful encounters with uh, Jesus Christ through two priests. One was in the middle of the night. Um, they had a, a firefighter who, was, uh, who had died, and they were carrying him. And they stopped right in front of me, in front of a guy dressed up with uh, construction gear, but he was actually a priest. And he, he blessed his body and prayed for him. And it was right there. It was just a very poignant moment in my own life. And, uh, and it was like in the middle of that darkness, there was some kind of light or some sense of the presence of God. And then a few days later, um, it was Sunday, and I saw a sign that said, R.I.P. Father Mike, uh, Father Michael Judge, who died, the Franciscan chaplain of the fire department. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I heard, I, it reminded me, it was Sunday, I woke up, and I said, I got to go to Mass. And I went, I looked for the Mass, but I, I had missed it, it finished. But a priest gave me the Eucharist. And I took the Holy Communion, and I went, and I just took a nap. I was exhausted. My lungs were filled up with the dust or whatever. Yeah. And in my nap, I felt like I slept all night, but I had this amazing dream. It was like a beautiful light or heaven, very peaceful, and it was a gift from the Eucharist. And I, I, I woke up and I realized I have to go. Mm. I felt such a peace, and I left. And it was after that experience I said, you know, I'm not ready to die. You could die any day. Yeah. And if I died that day, I, don't, I wasn't ready to meet God. And my friend, I had a good friend who said, why don't you go, you know, confess your sins, make a confession, and get some spiritual direction with a good priest. And I did. And I told the priest, I said, all right. I either want to get married or become a priest. I'm tired of just, you know, having yeah. fun and living for myself. And, uh, and he was great. He taught me. I ended up going to confession every couple of weeks, cleaned out. It felt so good. Mm -hmm. Going to daily mass and the rosary. And some months later, I had just a real powerful experience. Uh, God had been calling me progressively, but one day it was definitive. And I actually was driving in Pennsylvania. I pulled the car over and I surrendered. And it just it was a real uh, powerful moment for me. I cried. And I remember opening up the prayer book and it said, um, You have not chosen me. I have chosen you. Now go and bear fruit that will remain. Yeah. And the word just hit me in the head. I closed the book, got back on the highway, never looked back. And I was ordained about five years ago, and I see miracles every day. It's amazing. Well, the, throughout the Bible, you hear how God calls a lot of, especially Moses, and Moses kept fighting it. No, no, it can't be me. I can't be the one. And then finally, he gives in. And uh, I think Mary was the, the least to, to fight God. As soon as... God appeared to her, and she was like, yep, I'm ready. And, uh, you know, I think we're all called to do the right thing, for sure, yeah. but to step up and, and... Now, my biggest thing is I feel like people should say, you know, don't wait for somebody else to do it. You know, I should do it. And, uh, you know, I think that's important, and, that, and that's what you did. You, you said uh, you can't stand around and wait for somebody else to do it. I have to do it, you know. I, actually, I remember when... Uh, when I was in, in graduate school, um, before I had that experience at 9-11, and I had been reading the, the encyclicals and the writings of Pope John Paul II, I was getting inspired again for the faith. And uh, at the same time, there broke out a, a scandal, among, uh, some stories about priests who mm -hmm. had abused. And I got so angry. Yeah. And, and to me, it's an abomination. I, and I thought, how in the world could someone who's supposed to represent Christ yep. do such things? And I was angry. Yeah. And I'm sympathetic with people who are upset, and some people left the church because of that, and I understand yeah. that. And when, when I started to you know, press it, and in my prayer, I heard God back to me say, well, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. It's easy to you know, call the plays from the sidelines. Mm -hmm. you, you're upset? What are you going to do about it? Yeah. And he was challenging me. You know, if, if, you're, if you mean it, if you're really upset, do something about it. I thought, like, you know, if I get married and have kids, and I was thinking about becoming a priest when I was a kid, like, who's going to become a priest? And who yeah. would baptize my kids? Right. You know? Yeah. And, and I, I, the, the Lord worked on my own heart saying, like, what are you going to do about it, son? Mm -hmm. And so that challenged me. He knew yeah. kind of, I guess, my language of, uh, of our heart. He knows the language of our hearts. For me, I needed that. Yeah. To kinda, it's hard to make that decision to give up mm -hmm. wife and children and, and career and money and, and plans to, uh, to throw your life away, we say, for Jesus Christ. It's, it's hard to get to that point. But, so he has to kind of speak to the heart, and that's, that's one of the things he used to get to my heart. Well, you had the foundation. That's the most important thing. And Jesus talked about that with the seeds and the seeds that fell down on the good soil had the, the good roots and, and you had the perfect foundation for it. And then to be called, the opportunity was there and you were able to. So what, what school did you go to, to college? Uh, I went to a college in Indiana called Wabash College. Okay. And it's a small little private liberal arts school in Crawfordsville, Indiana. Great experience, great yeah. education. Um, and then uh, I worked for a year, and then I ended up at University of Chicago for a year of graduate school. Mm -hmm. And then um, 
the process of preparing to be a priest yeah. after I uh, came to New York and I, I went through that call. I ended up working at a magazine called First Things Magazine, which was founded by our father Richard John Newhouse, who died a few years ago. And uh, it was a think tank called the Institute of Religion and the Public Life, and he especially was writing about the intersection of, of, the, of the secular and the, and, and the sacred, mm -hmm. how, how, how religion and public life intertwine. So I worked for him for a couple of years and lived in like a community where you, uh, we had daily prayer and, and Saturday dinners together. It was a great experience. And then when I entered seminary, I was at uh, St. Joseph's Seminary in Yonkers. The St. John Neumann residence is where we studied philosophy, which was on the same campus of St. Joseph's Seminary at the time. Yeah. And then I did four years of theology at St. Joseph's Seminary. So. Before I was studying. Ready. Yeah, yeah, you got to prepare well. You yeah. got to prepare well. Yeah. Um, now, we talked before we came out, and I mentioned how when Jesus started his ministry, he was baptized by St. John, John the Baptist. And uh, real quick, since we mentioned uh, John the Baptist, what influence and, and what kind of uh, uh, example does he have for us today? Uh, St. John the Baptist or St. Yeah. John Paul II? No, St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist. Uh, phenomenal figure, phenomenal figure. Um, he was radical. Yeah. You know, it says he, that he was, he took that Nazarite vow, uh, it seems, that, you know, which is to not cut your hair and to live, to dedicate your life even as a child to God. And, and it says that he went out into the desert and lived on curds and honey, locusts. And so he was kind of a wild man yeah. um, in a good sense, but for the Lord. Yeah. And so he attracted many crowds because he was authentic. And I think that's what people hunger for is integrity. Yeah. You know, they knew John the Baptist was legit and for real. He fasted, he prayed, and he lived only for God. So he was a, a well-known prophet. And so when, in a sense, he hands over the baton to Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, he has all these apostles. Mm -hmm. Remember, Andrew was there in John's gospel. And Jesus descends into the, into the Jordan and they hear God's voice, the Father's voice, Behold my Son in whom I am well pleased. And they see the Holy Spirit descend upon him. And then he rises from the, from the river and John says, Behold the Lamb of God as he was approaching. No? And so Andrew, who's one of the apostles of John, one of the disciples of John, you know, in a sense, Jesus, he asks Jesus, Jesus, where do you go, Master? And he says, yeah. Come and see. And then the scripture says that Andrew went with Jesus and he spent the day with him. Mm -hmm. The very next scene, Andrew was running to Peter to say, we found the, the Messiah, we yeah. have found the Master. And so John the Baptist, he, he came onto the scene, he did his job to preach the gospel of repentance, mm -hmm. and he had his head chopped off for yeah. speaking the truth to Herod. You know, and, and, uh, and he's, he's a marvelous example of integrity to the faith yeah. and living our life at all costs yeah. for, for God and His will. And then Jesus went up into the mountain and He was tempted with all the kingdoms of the world. Now, what would have happened if he, you know, gave into temptation? Ah, well, I mean, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> I would be giving my life, you know, uh, for, for Jesus Christ because he would not be our Savior. Yeah. Um, in a sense, we do believe that the, the Lord was so yoked to the will of his Father that he would not have chosen against his Father. So deep was his love for his Father. Even, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's sweating blood. Yeah. And it's as if he has a premonition of the suffering he will experience in Calvary. And he says, Father, if it be your will, take this chalice of suffering from me. But not my will, thy will be done. And then he rises and enters into his passion. And so I don't believe, uh, yeah. I think he had such control of his own self, his, mm -hmm. uh, such self-composure, because his will was completely integrated with the Father, Definitely. that he would not have chosen to the temptations of the devil. Yeah. And, so, uh, and so he became the Savior of the world, to offer Himself freely for our sins so that the devil would lose his grip on us if we yoke ourselves to Jesus Christ. So the devil is real. Yeah. And just by talking about him that he was in front of Jesus, I kind of fell into this idea that it's just temptation. It's just our own choice of right from wrong. You know, that uh, because I don't have as much experience of the with the devil, that he is really out there. And what are some experiences you've had? No, surely, a absolutely, Satan is real. As God is real, Satan is real. Okay. As angels are real, demons are real. Uh, Pope Francis is, uh, is talking often about Satan and, mm -hmm. and his works. Um, we know that it's not just a psychological projection or an experience of human temptation. The devil is a real spiritual being. He was a fallen angel. Yep. And, and his anger and hatred of God he has had the run of the world to, to tempt men away from God as he did from the beginning with Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. And his works continue. 
I can share with you that you know, I have been present to an exorcism before, a couple exorcisms, not as an exorcist, but as yeah. a, a priest accompanying to pray. And I've witnessed people possessed by demons. And that possession is not human. It's, yeah. It is of a supernatural being that is extraordinarily evil. And outside of uh, exorcisms, there are more common, which are people that suffer demonic oppression. These are people that may have experienced or experimented with Ouija board or Satanism or witchcraft or yeah. in the Spanish community we call brujería or santería or curanderos yeah. and they expose their souls to demonic presences and they become affected by that. And as a priest I've been in hundreds of situations where we had to pray for liberation for people who are tormented by an evil spiritual presence which are demons. Yeah. And so, and I have many other experiences. We can look at the history of the church where, you know, St. John Vianney, the cure of ours of France, was literally attacked. The devil manifested himself to him and attacked him physically. He would have scratches on him when he would wake up some mornings. Padre Pio was also beaten up by the devil. Many saints have had expression, experiences of the manifestation of Satan himself. So don't be convinced for one moment yeah. that Satan is not real or that it's just temptation. Okay. It is not. In fact, that would be one of his great victories. C.S. Lewis famously wrote in the screw tape letters that one of the one of the tactics of the devil is to have mankind believe that he does not exist so he, they can be slowly lured into the numbness of sin. Right. Yeah. Now what do you think your strongest mission is for yourself? What, what do you want to do? What, what's the impact that you want to have? I, I think uh, the salvation of souls. Mm -hmm. my, my life, my, my existence is wrapped up into the salvation of souls. I wish and desire for all souls to come to know the love and the mercy of God that I have known and then to share that with them so that they also can come to know the mercy of God and ultimately go to heaven. So I think uh, the mission of a priest yeah. is fundamentally the salvation of souls and all of our efforts, all of our life, all of our works should be uh, wrapped up and geared towards coming to bring people to God and His love and bring the love of God to others so they will come to accept and believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ as our salvation of His cross and, and resurrection. Um, I believe it. I believe yeah. that those who live and die in Christ will rise with Christ. I believe John chapter 6 literally is true that those who eat my body and drink my blood will have life and eternal life. So my goal as a priest is to bring as many people back to the sacraments mm -hmm. as possible. So many people have separated themselves from regular practice of the faith or of the religion. There's a common notion today that well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, and I, I beg to differ with that. And I wish yeah. to challenge people that, that wish for that. I think we have to take Jesus Christ uh, at face value, and His words are, are, have true meaning when He says, if you wish to have life and eternal life, you must eat my body and drink my blood. So my hope and prayer is to help unite people once again to the sacraments. And I know that that leads to happiness. I've seen and experienced the joy of being in communion with God mm -hmm. sacramentally. And I see it every day. And I wish for people who are in darkness, especially the poorest of the poor. So many people walk through this world um, abandoned, lonely, desperate, and they have not yet known the love of God. And I think it's our obligation as followers of Christ yeah. to be those instruments of true compassion and love, especially to those most wounded, most broken in this world. That's beautiful. I love that. And uh, I think that is very important. You know, there's so much stuff on TV that just fills these, the young people with nonsense, you know, and, you know, reading just the, uh, the Gospels, if you can do that over and over. Of the four Gospels, would, which one do you lean towards as your favorite? No, great question. Uh, it, the Gospel of John is my favorite. Okay. You know, the, the, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mm -hmm. have, have much similarity in many of the same stories and maybe some of the same sources, Scripture yep. scholars tell us. Yeah. John is is uh, something distinct and mm -hmm. uh, I'm attracted to to the style of John's writing and to the mystical realities in John's gospel. Yeah. Um, also John had a, uh, a special vocation. He, we believe he was the apostle present at the foot of the cross. <clears throat> yeah. Out of humility he names himself the beloved disciple rather than I John. Yeah. Um, but we believe that was John, the, the youngest of the disciples, the apostles. And I love that at the foot of the cross Jesus from the cross, one of his seven last words is, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. And it says, from that hour the apostle took her into his home. And so John spent, we believe, those years with Mary and was taken up probably into Ephesus where they lived together. 
Um, and I just imagine he probably absorbed from her. And I can't imagine. I, I think if, if I, I, I think I would have loved to have had that, that, uh, that tremendous responsibility and that tremendous uh, privilege to spend time with our Blessed Mother. I, I gave my life to the Blessed Mother completely as a seminarian and then once again renewed it as a priest. So I live my life for Our Lady. I, I love Our Lady. I'm in love with Our Lady. I, I'm attracted to Our Lady. I wish to bring others to the beauty and the grace of Our Lady and her purity. Yeah. And, uh, and so I guess John, for me, is, uh, is a figure who stands out among the Gospels. Your point about reading the Gospel is critical. Uh, when I came to seminary, my spiritual director, who I had great confidence in, he gave me basically an instruction, which is read one chapter of the Gospel every single day. Yeah. And complete the four Gospels, then finish that, and go back and repeat that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It takes about three and a half months. Read a chapter a day. Then when you finish that, go back and read them again. And, yeah. and do, repeat that Constant. every day of your Constantly, life. Constantly, yeah. Yeah. Be, and why? And he, said, and, and he said, you could take all the spiritual writings, all the books of the lives of the saints, and set them aside. If you just try to live and believe the words and deeds of Jesus Christ yeah. and imitate what's in the gospel, you'll become a saint. <laughs> it's all there. It's, it's, yeah. it's the pure word of God. Yeah. And so that's, that's our, our base. We must live on the Gospels and well, come I, to know them. I and love, they're alive. I love to say that, you know, Jesus was the Word made flesh, and that Word is love. And, you know, and love is, is a word that encompasses a lot of other things, you know, faithfulness and trust and hard work and, you know, all the things that, that love encompasses. And, and He is the living Word of, of love. So, uh, you, Well put. Well put. I mean, it, it, actually, it makes sense. I mean... It says in John's Gospel, the Word became flesh, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the light came into the world and darkness could not overcome it. But in, and then in one of John's letters, 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, John writes, God is love, and he who remains in love remains in God and God in him. And that's the goal. Yeah. That's the beauty of Pope Francis. That's the beauty of Saint John Paul II, Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, is that they became like love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so God's presence so radiated so powerfully through them yeah. because their love was so profound. Yeah, and it's the most beautiful thing. Um, I knew this was going to happen. Uh, half hour just flew by already. Okay. So we're gonna, when we're done, we're going to go get another date. Okay. And you have to come back on probably a month from now. So this show will run for a month. Okay. And uh, so I'll cook next time. I, I knew we had plenty of time, <laughs> you know, to talk here. So it's great. Thank you. The next show, I'll do some cooking. I don't know uh, what your favorite food is. I, I'd be glad. I, I eat anything and yeah. everything pretty happily, right. I would say. Uh, but I know you're Italian and, uh, <laughs> you know, good linguine, you know, pasta. All right. Uh, well, I'm not allowed to cook seafood here because okay. it, it's so I'll, I'll think of something. All good. right. Anything. I'll eat anything. I'll be glad. I'll be glad All to right. receive what you, what you present. Excellent. Yeah. Real quick, we have probably 30 seconds, okay. so uh, how are you enjoying your stay at uh, the Assumption? Ah, absolutely love it. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't want to go anywhere. I want to stay here as long as I can. Oh, I know. I was going to say that. Are they going to try and move you, or are they going to let you stay? Only God knows. The Cardinal know. knows. But uh, yeah. no, I'm so pleased. Uh, it's an amazing community filled with great people yeah. on the Spanish There's side. There's a great diversity of people here, for sure. It's they, a melting pot. Well, both. The English and the Spanish communities in, at Assumption are very loving. It's yeah. a very warm, loving place. And our pastor, Father John Higgins, phenomenal, yeah, joyful, he's, he's awesome. happy. And we have a great time together. With Father Cruz, our new priest, we're, we had Father Vernon for 11 years. He's off the Holy Spirit. But we're having a great time, and uh, it's, oh, every day I look forward to it. Yeah, I know. It's such a great joy. Yeah. All right. I'm Victor Margiata. This is The Community Show. Uh, I just want to tell people, that, you know, get back into church. Uh, it's, it's something that gives your, your heart and your soul something to live for and uh, get rid of all those demons and get rid of all the, the bad thoughts in your head and uh, you know read the Bible go back to church and hopefully uh, do the right thing all right thanks for watching Great.